I'd like to start by answering your questions. No, I'm not a dwarf, <laughs> nor am I a hobbit. I like to think that I'm dimensionally transcendental, but it doesn't take a doctor to work out that's impossible. I might look 17, but I'm 1.3 in dog years, 8.5 in peacock years, 40-odd as a giant tortoise, and 1,729 as an immortal jellyfish. I've built a science lab in my basement, been trained in historical broadsword technique, baited bandicoots with peanut butter, and been stalked by a leopard in Botswana. So now that we're acquainted, shall I begin? The year is 1831, and the HMS Beagle lies resting on its moorings off the port of Plymouth Sound. Aboard, the young Charles Darwin waits to set sail on the expedition of a lifetime, four years at sea, traversing a continent and changing the course of history. I'm talking about evolution. But hold your hippopotami, where on earth does saving the world come in? Let's think about it, shall we? Nature has had, well, right about four billion years to come up with the very best strategies it can for survival. 400 years ago, we as humans started properly taking it apart. And only 40 years ago did it occur to us that might not have been the very best idea and to take measures to, to stop nature's obliteration as well as ours. So are we really all that smart? Time for a test. Up on the screen behind me, you can see the numbers one through nine, randomly positioned. I'd like you to remember where they are, that's all. Take your time. Now, under each of your seats, you should find a single sheet of paper. I'd like you to take it out and fill it in with the numbers as best you can. Ready? Now, here's the original slide. How did you go? Can I get a show of hands? How many of you got it right? <laughs> to put things in perspective, that same test you just did is used by researchers in Kyoto University in Japan on a seven-year-old chimp named Ayumu. He gets it right almost every time. <laughs> Chimpanzees such as Ayumu have evolved to have a far better working memory than our own. Likewise, far from forgetting car keys, a homing pigeon could locate a vehicle 1,100 miles distant, and a blindfolded elephant could individually locate any one of some 30 family members in this room. What if, what if we could harness all this knowledge for good? use nature's ways to mend it, in doing so, avoiding our own human flaws and bias. Evolution teaches us about change, good change, change that sticks, precisely the sort of change we need right now to save our living planet. Here's what that means. Turn to the person next to you. What do you see? Brown hair, blue eyes? blue hair, brown eyes. It doesn't matter. The point is, they are different from you, from the next person, and the next, and the next, and so on. Each of you an individual. It's the same with animals. One macaque will be different from the next macaque, each and from the rest of its colony. These differences, be they subtle or otherwise, provide the fuel in which evolution runs, the core of Darwin's theories. Science and society view species as they do shampoo or skincare products, each one a brand label promising certain features, albeit rather banal and oversold. Each label encompasses many bottles, every one of them identical. But animals are not clones. Personality and self-awareness, heightened emotions and consciousness, all can be observed in the animal kingdom, 
yet still we try to reserve these merits for ourselves. Why? Once we look beyond the smokescreen of generalizations, false truths, and sweeping conclusions, new realms of thought appear. We see the rights of nature movement emerge, those isolated activists fighting for legal personhood and its privileges for other life forms. But we also begin to see reflections of ourselves, an alpha chimp's dominance displays in a politician's blustering speech, a young child's curiosity in an elephant calf just learning to use its trunk. Perhaps most importantly, we now attribute fresh value to our animal cousins, because conservation should not be a selfish exercise. We hear of giant pandas being bred and released to restore China's national pride, or so that our grandchildren perhaps might see them. Rather, we do so as recompense for the damage already wrought on their kind, as a feeble kind of apology and a making amends. In print, the human genome would require about 5,000 copies of Darwin's On the Origin of Species to describe. Some would consider it the greatest wonder of the natural world, and yet all of it is contained in a space so small as to be invisible to the naked eye. Where random variation is the fuel, DNA is the raw materials and factory combined that forms the very first step for evolution to proceed. You've probably heard of the IUCN Red List. It's a mammoth database of over 100,000 animal species describing exactly how close each one of them is to extinction. A pessimistic outlook for a dying world. A rather more recent concept is that of the IUCN Green List, a project with similar intended scope, but one crucial difference. Instead of acting as some sort of universal doomsday clock for life on Earth, this flips the image and focuses only on those species that are recovering, experiencing marked success. It might seem a feeble gesture in the face of widespread declines, but this movement of conservation optimism, as it's now been called, is truly a force to be reckoned with. Put simply, inaction is the bane of conservation. So, by recognizing and fating these smaller milestones, we gain much needed momentum, boosting morale and fighting against apathy at large. Youth, like myself, are a lever of sorts, able to see the bigger picture, and Greta Thunberg attests to the power that each and every one of us holds in this delicate balance of paths. Oops. A great mind once said that insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. With an infinite wealth of knowledge, everything in life becomes eminently predictable, except life itself. When working with entire landscapes or ecosystems to conserve, the complexity is mind-boggling. Small changes produce a landslide effect, and the change we as humans have brought on our planet can hardly be described as small. Evolution, just like history, has a habit of repeating itself. Adaptions that work well are seen over and over again in species separated by vast tracts of evolutionary history. These designs are the blueprints for success, so to speak, because there's no such thing as plagiarism in survival of the fittest. What about us? Well, believe it or not, there are some Einsteins amongst the sheep who've clocked that four billion years testing ain't bad for product reviews. A new field of biomimicry has emerged, taking nature's blueprints and redrawing for our own human commodities and systems. Thanks to animals, we have, or will soon have, bullet trains inspired by kingfishers, phone screens inspired by seashells, antifreeze inspired by cod, painless surgical needles inspired by mosquitoes, 
Wetsuits, inspired by otters. Wind turbines, inspired by whales. Space rovers, inspired by desert spiders. Gene editing technologies, inspired by bacteria. And many, many more brilliant technologies. These exact same principles work wonders for environmental management, too. We're beginning to recognize the importance of ecosystem connectivity, building new circular economies, employing systems thinking and holistic practices across the board. It's all proven, it works. With these techniques at hand, we can stop acting like some malevolent god figure and more as a fairy godmother in nurturing nature, back to health. Evolution takes hundreds of millions of years. We all know that life finds a way, but once it does, it hardly takes its time about it. The thing about evolution is it can be slow, but once it starts to make a move, once the species begins to diverge, grow a limb or a funky head press, it all takes place in the blink of an eye. Scientists have made snails turn slug in a single generation, and it doesn't take a lot. The key to it all lies in selective pressures, new variables introduced into the circle of life, forcing species to change. Humans are one, indeed chief amongst them, but now we're at a stage where the main selective pressures we face are those we have imposed upon ourselves. Global inequality, famine and conflict, climate change, biodiversity loss. These are the problems we are so reluctant to address because to do so is to confront our own human vanity, our overgrown ego. Stagnation brings with it a slow demise for any species stretched beyond its limits. That includes humans. We need to adapt our relationship with nature in order to continue our own way of life. And the means for doing so are out there. Not so long ago, the esteemed biologist E.O. Wilson put forward a vision for a half-Earth project, setting aside 50% of our lands and oceans for the benefit of Earth's biodiversity safeguarding almost 90% of species from the extinctions so many will otherwise face. Coral reefs are said to be somewhat of a lost cause, doomed to disappear within decades from warming acid oceans. But if we have the courage to act now, to engineer in those species such as we have left, the ability to cope with their changing environment, then much of what is left might just survive. It's a risk, too many factors to possibly account. But I think I speak on behalf of all our corals when I say they're willing to take the chance. To pull this whole mess together, I'd like to end with a thought towards a subject I've mentioned thus far only in passing, us. There's a funny word called anthropomorphism, and it basically means speaking of animals as though they were people. It's caused much consternation over the years amongst environmentalists and academics alike. Why? Because we don't like to think that animals can be human. It undermines our sense of self. The brilliant primatologist Franz de Waal counters this with his own term, anthropo-denial. And really, this is by far the more common incident referring to a selective blindness we collectively employ in our regard of other life forms. To save the world, we must abandon this age-old stigma of ours. But more than that, we must embrace nature on equal footing and learn from its experience. Evolution teaches us not only of change, but of humility. There's no such thing as more evolved, although many undoubtedly wish it were so. The dragonfly is the most successful of all hunters, its body plan proven over hundreds of millions of years, more than our own. As this speech, I hope, has shown, life is about change, and we as humans have a long way to go. Our selective pressure lies in our arrogance, our inability to let go. But we are better than that. With all the power 
in your oversized brains. I would like you to read this slide and remember it. Evolution is a law. Let's obey it. Thank you.